All right. So, as I said, we're on Unit 8, confronting the Holocaust in the, in the Soviet Union. The outbreak of the Second World War initiated a new and tragic period in the history of the Jews of, of Russia. The Polish defeat by the, by the Nazis... Uh, by Nazi Germany, a campaign began, which began in 1939, led to a partition of the country by Germany and the Soviet Union. And so now there's all sorts of new people in under the rule of each. Though Hitler had, had been relatively slow about putting the more extreme elements of Nazi uh, anti-Semitism into practice, by the time the war had broken out, he was set. And the deep-seated hatred of the Jews became more and more and more evident. Following the brutal um, violence of Kristallnacht on November 9th and 10th of 39, of uh, 38 rather, a hundred Jews are killed uh, in, in Germany and Austria, and over 400 synagogues are burned down. Hitler actually became a little bit upset because the, the domestic and foreign leaders weren't as supportive of what he had done as he thought they would be. And so he actually turns around and entrusts the policy on the Jews to the ideologues of the of the SS. The invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, June of 1941, by German forces. They're supported by troops from Finland, Hungary, Italy, Romania, and Slovakia. And it, that is what enables, at the end of the day, the genocide that, that played out. The conflict that followed was seen by the Nazis as an ideological struggle, as well as a war of extermination. So let's talk a little bit about the Soviet experience with this. Soviet treatment of, of the experience of the Holocaust had profound effects on Jews within Russia because it denied any sympathy to Jews from the part of non-Jews because what they did is they universalized the experience. They denied Jewish particular particularism in this. It wasn't a war against Jews. It was a war against communism. And as a result, Soviet non-Jews, unlike in the West, during and following the war, felt no need to make up to the Jews for what wrongs done to them. Before World War II, 1.5 million Jews lived in the Ukraine. This is the Soviet, Soviet Republic of the Ukraine. It constitutes the largest section of Jews in, in the in Soviet Union, as well as in Europe. Between 1939 and 1941, the number of Jews in Ukraine rose to 2.5 million from all the Jews fleeing from Poland and Germany. The Jews in the Ukraine, even prior to the uh, even prior to the Nazi invasion, especially those near Poland, had really a very difficult environment to be to live in, even prior to the Nazi world, because the Ukrainians perceived the Jews as collaborators of the Soviet communists who had recently taken over the last of the communities there. And to the extent that the Jews were identified with communism as a result in the Soviet regime, they were also perceived as the enemies of the Ukrainian people. This is before Hitler is, is in the picture. Some parts of the Ukrainian population actually looked to the Nazis to sponsor a Ukrainian state to get them out of the fold of the Soviet Union and to get, the, get rid of the detested Jews, Russians, and communists. There are others in the Ukraine who also, however, also fought in the Soviet army against the Ukrainian government and their collaborators, and some aided and saved Jews along the way. So what you've got is a situation of Jews living in Russia where the life is very difficult even before the invasion of the Nazis. Before the institution of the concentration camps, more than 1.5 million Jews, or one out of every four Jewish victims of the Holocaust, had already been murdered prior to the concentration camps. They'd been murdered by the Germans, their Axis allies, the local collaborators in the, in the uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Russian republics. And I've given you a map there. If you have the sheet, I've given you a map 
of, of the Ukraine, so you can kind of get a sense of what we're looking at. Although in today's world, it's on the news all the time, so you have a probably have a better sense anyway. During the summer of 1941, mobile Nazi units, which had begun shooting all adult Jewish males during the invasion of the Soviet Union, expanded this to include a genocide targeting the women, the children, the aged, and the entire Jewish communities. These were the first victims of the Holocaust, of, of the Holocaust, part of what is known by historians as the Holocaust by bullets. Again, one and a half million. This is even prior to the, the concentration camps. They were not transported by trains to the killing sites. Instead, these were these victims were taken from their homes, usually by foot, to the outskirts of a city, a town, a village where they lived often in the presence of the local residents and non-Jewish neighbors. And they were shot. The Nazis understood the impact of this on the local population. And so oftentimes after they'd go into a community and wipe out the Jewish population, to erase the impressions of the day, an order was issued for an evening of camaraderie. And so after a mass shooting, they would have meals prepared by local residents, music, and drinking, because they understood that those who had witnessed what they had seen might rebel. And so they created a party out of it. A large part of this really began, as I said, in the Soviet Union. It's there because of the Nazi identification of Jews within Bolshevism. If only we had the power people attribute to us. One of the main foundations of the Nazi ideology, and it appeared frequently in Hitler's speeches and in Nazi propaganda, was, was that Jews ran the Bolshevist, Bolshevik movement. All right. You see this in his speech in January 30, 1939. It's an example in that speech, not reading number one. Jo Joyce, you don't have it. So Eric, do you have reading number one? Yeah. Please. Yeah, Hitler in a speech, January 30th, 1939. Today I will once more be a prophet. If the international Jewish financiers in and out of Europe should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, then the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth and thus the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. All right. He, he's tying Bolshevism to Jews. Jews control it. During the planning period of Operation Barbarossa, which was the invasion of the Soviet Union, Hitler sent the Wehrmacht uh, some corrected guidelines to the plan, and he wrote reading number two. Sandy, you've got reading two. You're in the box. The Ukrainian State Archives of the October Revolution this coming war is more than a fight with arms. It leads you to a conflict of two worldviews. To finish the war, it is not enough to defeat the enemy's armies. The Jewish Bolshevist intelligentsia, which until now has oppressed the nation, must be removed. Okay. And then in 1941, a commissar's order, order repeats Hitler's ideas, reading number three. And Lou, you've got the winning box. Unmute. Yeah. Is, is that a no? Okay. All right. Sandy, go ahead. I Lou's still struggling with the technology. Uh, L Leslie, go ahead. Reading number three. You need to yeah. unmute, though. Leslie, unmute. Uh, there. Sorry. There you go. There you go. When fighting Bolshevism, one cannot count on the enemy acting in accordance with the principles of humanity or international law. In particular, it must be expected that the treatment of our prisoners by the political commissars of all types, who are the true pillars of resistance, will be cruel, inhuman, and dictated by hate. Therefore, when captured either in battle or offering resistance, they are to be shot on principle. One, in this battle, it would be a mistake to show mercy or respect for international law towards such elements. 
They constitute a danger to our own security and to the rapid pacification of the occupied territories. Two, the barbaric Asiatic fighting methods ori originate with the political commissars. Action must therefore be taken against them immediately without further consideration and with all severity. Okay. What this directive is doing essentially is establishing a security policy of terror. And under this under this, this mindset, that he's sanctioning the mass killing of any group that could be seen as a potential threat. All right. And so uh, 1941, Heydrich sends his guidelines to the senior SS and police leaders of the, of the Soviet Union, and he writes the following. He says, all of the following are to be executed, Jews in the party and in state employment and other radical elements. Well, since indeed in the Soviet Union, it's centralized. Everyone's employed by the state. So that essentially is, in, in effect, is in order to kill all the Jews. You're saying anybody, any, Jew, who, any Jew associated working for the state is to be killed? Well, that's all the Jews. That's everybody. According to Nazi myth, Russian uh, Bolshevik Russia is the main headquarters for world Jewry. It's the nexus of the world Jewish plot. The struggle against against Jewry begins with the decapitation of that leadership in Russia. All Soviet Jews, women, children, the ages are considered commissars. And this, believe it or not, it, German authorities believed in earnest that the Soviet state its policies, and the resistance to the German invasion is all controlled by the Jews. We ran Russia. And we all know that our relatives went fleeing from the country. But nonetheless, the perception is we ran Russia. What's that? Okay. In the Ukraine, as I said to you, most of the Jews were murdered in the first weeks or months of the Nazi occupation by the Einsatzgruppen, the, the, the uh, shooters. As the large sections of the Soviet Union fell into German hands, the military, before anybody could set up a government in the lands they conquered, they would issue directives in the ways in which the Jews were to be exterminated. Now, we all know they saved a few people here and there, skilled artisans, skilled workers that, that somehow say, that did their bidding, as well as those who were building uh, Hitler's headquarters along the way. But essentially, they did not, they, the minute they ran over, a, ran over a new town, they didn't wait for governments, they killed all the Jews in the community. The German, the German advance through Belarusia, which is just north of the Ukraine, was more rapid than any other front in the Soviet Union. And that's because Belarusia lay on the path to Moscow. And so as a result, what the Germans did is they sent their best soldiers that direction. And so they, they're, they're, the swiftness of their advance caught the civilian population, Jews included, by surprise. When they would come into a town, before, I'm sorry, before they'd enter a town or a city, about half of the Jews would have managed to have left. Viewing these events as we sit here in our in our nice warm rooms in, 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 in Houston, all right, from the peaceful perspective of post-war times and armed with the knowledge of what is to come, one wonders why the other half didn't leave. Why mm. did they stay there? Everyone there seemed to know that the Germans hated Jews more than any other group. And so the sensible thing would be to abandon their homes and flee to the interior of Russia, go further, deeper into Russia, where it will be safer. The reality, however, was far more complex. Withdrawal of, of a local population in the face of an enemy can be successful only when it's organized, and when it's organized well in advance while the enemy is still far away. To flee from the frontline area on one's own is a difficult and risky undertaking. The roads are crowded. Just think of what happens when there's a hurricane. All right, we all people try to leave town. The roads are crowded. 
few people have adequate vehicles. People didn't have bicycles. And even if you had a bicycle, what, what were you going to carry with you? All right. And very few horses and carts. Additionally, this is not a group of people that traveled very much. They did not have a knowledge of the countryside or the roads. And so it was easily easy for them to become disoriented and fall into the hands of the Germans or of the thieves that were just roaming the, the, the forest, per se. There are other factors as well. So another is martial law. Remember, we talked about where would they flee? They'd flee further into Russia. That would be their goal. According to the laws, however, a worker in a Soviet state could not leave work or be dismissed without permission from the higher authorities. Workers were effectively chained to their position until the initial chaos begins. Secondly, is the sense of a moral imperative kept those who, did, even those who didn't have the jobs, from leaving. Even in peacetime, it's hard to leave one's home, and many and many more times difficult when you are being regarded officially and by public opinion as a deserter. All right. So factory workers and office workers and doctors and nurses all stayed because they felt they were doing their duty to the motherland. So they're, they're being loyal citizens. Additionally, the fact is they cannot leave because they'll be labeled criminals and, and, and deserters. And as a result, where are they going to go in Russia once that, once that label applies? When at last, the local authorities summon up the courage to start the evacuation of the population, the first and often the only train would be filled by those categories of people who were, as the authorities understood it, in the greatest danger from a German occupation. Jews, ironically, did not fill, fit into that category. From the official point of view, those in the greatest danger were the state and party officials and the families of the Red Army. So in other words, those who were leading Russia were in the greatest danger from their perspective. From the German perspective, who was leading Russia? The Jews. Right? There, the, you know, there's no win here. In addition to the objective physical and social barriers to evacuation, the Jewish population also faced subjective psychological barriers. The psychology of a peaceful period was still at work. This is happening very quickly. Few Jews really understood, how, they understood things were bad, but how bad is bad enough? That, that's the hard question in making a decision to leave. What's bad enough, okay? They, they were told by the Soviet propaganda. This was, the newspapers were saying this coming war would be one with little blood and it's going to be held on foreign territory. Don't worry. It's not coming home. The con that conviction, <clears throat> combine it with all of the untruthful information that's coming their way, and you end up with exaggerated hopes of things will be okay. Just kind of take it easy. The common belief was this was a temporary phenomenon. It would end in a major Soviet Jewish uh, Soviet offensive, and the result is your best bet is to sit out the war in your villages and just kind of just stay away from things. Excuse me. There was little information coming to the Russians about the Nazi potential anti-Jewish measures, uh, uh, Nazis' anti-Jewish measures. The beginning of the war, the mass media attacks on ge German anti-Semitism, many Jews saw this as a propaganda ploy. Again, you know, it's like if you watch CNN, everything on Fox is propaganda. If you watch Fox, everything on CNN is propaganda. What do you believe? And as I said to you, and, and anything that's coming through, the information is that the greatest danger is not to the Jews anyway. It's to communists. And the Jews giving this information, many of them believed it. In an atmosphere of where you have all this contradictory information, the question to leave or not leave often was based on what now seems trivial. 
if you remember, I talked about the fact that we talked about um, uh, what do you, the, the land where they, the, I'm drawing a blind, Biro Bijan, where they were sending the Jews and they were trying to create an economy for Jews. At the end of the 30s, when they stopped that, the economy actually began to improve. So now you've got a situation in which you've got lack of information, skewed information when it does come through, assumption of propaganda, an improving economy, and after decades of poverty, it's not easy then when they when things get better to turn around and leave everything you own. So why do they stay? There's your answer. Any, I'm going to stop here for lots of comments. You know, I, I just I'll share a conversation I had. I was I had dinner last night with uh, Jacobo and and Chaya Varone, and I I said that we were talking about uh, about uh, the elections that are coming, and some there a lot of people are quite afraid of of what what it means for Jews across the spectrum, and I said to them, okay, you know, have you considered plans to go elsewhere? was my question, because I know there are people who have talked about it. And they said to me, are you kidding? No matter how bad it is here, it's better than it is in Mexico. It's better than it is there. It's better, no matter, it, 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 it's all a perspective. So again, how bad is bad enough to get up and leave? And what are your alternatives? Mm -hmm. The massacre at Babiar, perhaps the most famous mass shooting in the Ukraine took place at Babi Yar. September 19, for, uh, 1941, German forces enter the city of Kiev, which we all, it's on everybody's radar again, the capital of the Ukraine. Prior to the invasion, German invasion of the Soviet Union, there were approximately 160,000 Jews in Kiev, uh, representing about 20% of the population. Once the invasion was underway, of that 160,000, 100,000 either fled or were conscripted into the Red Army. The majority, those 60,000 who remained, were primarily women, children, and elderly. So essentially, the most vulnerable, pe vulnerable people are who is left in the city when the Germans, Germans enter. On September 29 and 30 of that, of that year, Jews throughout the city are rounded up. They're taken to a ravine near at, called Babayard, located just outside the city. The victims, as you know, were summoned to the site, forced to undress, required to enter the ravine, and then shot in small groups. A, a German report states that almost 34,000 Jews were executed at Babayard. Right, that's almost the population, Jewish population in Houston. In addition to these large scale massacres similar to Babi Yar, there were almost 500 smaller mass shootings in towns and villages throughout the Ukraine. And I've given you a map where you can see it's just all over the place. All right, one town after another, they'd walk in and just massacre everybody shootings again this is prior to the concentration camps a paul a, a a poet by the name of Ilya selvinsky who had served in the army had become a colonel published several news army newspapers wrote a poem called i saw it it was first published in the newspaper bolshevik and then reprinted in red star the army newspaper I saw it concerns the murder of the Jews that took place at a ravine outside of Kerch in 1941. A year later, after the Soviets retook Kerch, Salvinsky visited the site, a ditch where 7,000 women, children, and elderly lie shot to death. In a, in a letter to his wife, he wrote, and I saw them. I don't have the strength now to write about it in prose. My nerves have stopped reacting. What could I do? I expressed it in verse. This key phrase, I saw them, appears not only in his letter to his wife, but it became the title of the poem. The opening stanza 
claims the role of eyewitness and offers evidence of the mass murder. Reading number four, I think, Marsha, you were up. Okay. You may ignore folk tales, doubt the newspaper, but I saw it with my own eyes. Understand? I saw it myself. Here's the road and over there hills. Between them like this, a ravine. From this ravine, grief rises without limit. No, you can't use words for this. You have to howl, scream, 7,000 shot dead in a frozen pit that turned red like rust. Who are these people? Soldiers? No. Partisans? Right? No. Oh, it goes on. Okay. Yeah. Every cry that flies from. Right, the... hold, hold on one second. So, I'm what sorry. he, I, I, let me just summarize a little bit. So, the 7,000 that he found dead in this frozen pit, he's saying they have to be heard. They need a voice. But the problem is, it's an impossible language. How do you communicate the pain in language? Go, now, continue on. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, every cry that flies from their lips corresponds to an implacable grammar. Here you would have to call an assembly from every tribe and extract from each all that is human. Everything that burst through the centuries, shrieks, cries, sighs, and groans, the echo of attacks, pogroms, butchery. Wouldn't this utterance of bottomless torment be equal to the word that is sought? Simply, there are no words. But it, it's an inchoate cry. There's no way to express. And, you know, he, in, in words, in poetry, he's saying there are no words. Mm -hmm. All right. Bill, you want to read reading number six? Go on then. Brand them. You stand before the massacre. You caught them red-handed. Condemn them. You see how the butchers... Bullets smashed us to pieces, thunder forth like Dante, like Ovid. Let nature herself cry, if you yourself saw all this and haven't gone out of your mind. You want me to continue? Wait, no, hold on one second. In three succeed, uh, succeeding stanzas, <clears throat> Selvinsky picks out details about three different victims. One is a young man with an amputated leg. A second is a peasant woman, a Christian, who reproaches the Virgin Mary for what the Germans have done. And the third, a Jewish woman and her child. The mention of the Christian woman, all right, conforms to the Soviet cliche of the universality of the suffering. It isn't only about Jews. This, the Nazis just want all, all of the... Uh, the, the, the um, communists all right you then have the jewish woman and her child representing the inhabitants of the surrounding collective farms whose populations did indeed have many many jews and finally you've got the mention of an amputee it's also delivered because the nazis had a pol policy of exterminating those who were disabled he's picked on three the description of the jewish mother and her child is the longest and the most emotional. And that's reading seven. Go ahead, keep going, Bill. Next to her, a tormented Jewish woman with a child, completely as if in a dream. With what care the child's neck is wrapped in the mother's scarf. A mother's heart doesn't change. Going to be shot under the gun an hour, a half hour before death. The mother protected the child from catching cold. But even death is no parting for them. The enemy has no power over them now, and a red stream from the child's ear drips into the mother's cupped palm. As you read, first of all, I'm, I'm open to any reactions. Yes, Sandy. Somehow, how this were meant to be. So. Sandy, it broke up. We didn't, it, it yeah. didn't hear you. Okay. I, I said, this somehow reminds me of the accounts of what happened on October 7th, uh, the brutality 
the unbelievable brutality, the rape of women, cutting a child out of the mother's womb, mm. et cetera. You, you just, you're, you have a total loss of words to describe yeah. how <laughs> horrible it is. It's not just murder. It's, it's mm -hmm. barbarism. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I hadn't made that connection. Good. Good. And in, in particular about the 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 blood from the child's ear mm -hmm. dipping into the mother's cup palm, even in death, she's trying to help her child. Yeah. I see a, a bit of a difference though, or I can't imagine, because October 7th, those people were from the time they're born almost, they learned hate and kill the Jews. They don't know anything else. But back in this time, these people weren't exposed to that kind of raising up that I'm aware of. And this was all new to them. And yet they still had the stomach to follow orders to kill. I mean, I don't know how in their heads they can do that, but somehow they, they can kill women and children just innocently laying there. So just if I, it, it, you know, let's look at the 10 years prior to this, you know, Hitler came to power in 33, even before he came to power, however, there was already a, um, a, a, a culture of, of blame from World War I, of which the Jews were very commonly uh, associated he then put it into the newspapers and he used every piece of every piece of uh, marketing available to him to further that that belief. I, I think you're right. There is a distinction, but it's not as absolute as as you're kind of describing. They, they certainly were exposed to a lot of anti-Semitism. Lou? Um, yeah, Bill's comment about the soldiers, the Nazi Russian um, German soldiers not having grown up with kill the Jews. Uh, and how could they do it? Well, it, it did bother them, um, maybe not enough, uh, and maybe not before the killings and the murders took place, but that's one of the reasons why the camps were established, to remove the soldiers from the killing. Yeah, en enough were complaining that, yes, that, that's also true. Yep. There, there, there's, obviously, there's obviously no way to understand fully what the experience is and how people can do this. But there was, I think all those factors are true. They they were exposed to a lot. They still experienced some pain in doing it. The concentration camps were in a way of, of overcoming that. Yeah. Okay. You have this description of a pat. Yes, Leslie. Um, am I muted? No, we can hear you. Okay, okay, good. The the few words were so visual, and having seen pictures years ago in books or on TV or something, Baba Yar and the mother holding and the baby, it and and the the blood is dripping and the mother's trying to save the child. It's just an unimaginable. How can anybody do that? It's one thing if someone has a rifle and they're shooting at you and you're in the army and you have to protect yourself. But this, it's heartbreaking. It's just horrible. Right. It's it's one of the reasons you have to be very careful when you hear the uh, in the news sort of the labeling of other minorities. Yes. And, 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 and words are put on them that attribute to them almost a less than human status. Because that's what the that's what enables that's what in some way infects mm -hmm. the minds and enables people to do things that they would not otherwise do, along with the whole group mentality of, of things as well. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, in two weeks, I'll, one of the things I'll talk about is is uh, looking at how the average German sat by and watched it as well. But we'll, mm -hmm. we'll wait till we get there. Okay. So you have this description of a passive Jewish mother. All right. And that dramatically changes in a subsequent stanza <laughs> when the poet declares that the mother's hands, now a fist, will burn through the Germans in, in their blue waltzes. The image of the mother's fist transforms Jewish suffering into Jewish revenge. 
an important dimension of the Soviet Jewish response to Nazi suffering. And so through the open hand and the gentle and, and, and the passive Jewish mother, he, he portrays a response by shifting into a fist at a later point. Mm -hmm. This poem, I saw it, does not name the implied narrator as a Jew, nor does it explicitly identify the 7,000 corpses in the ravine as Jews, except in the case of the Jewish mother vignette. The Soviets, however, they knew who the victims were. The mention of the Jewish mother would have been alone would have been enough. However, Selvinsky also used, and you saw this in a lot of newspapers at the time, the Soviet code for Jewish victims. They were called peaceful Soviet citizens. That was usually a code word for Jews. You know, Joyce, did you have a question? Yeah. No, just a comment that it really wasn't until Glasnost when the killing fields were me memorialized to mention the Jews. Before yeah. Glasnost, all the killing fields never mentioned the Jews. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, what, what, wasn't there another mode by which the Jews were killed? There were mobile killing vans where they yeah, sent the yeah. exhaust into. Yep. Yeah. But that was early on, I think. And, and yes, uh, it wasn't as effective for the Germans. Well, it's not because nearly as effective because it, because you, you've got to keep moving around. You've got smaller little little units. Um, yeah. People are the, the local community can see it, and and as Lou said, then you've got many people who are doing this who who are affected by it, and they try to yeah. they try to centralize it so it's fewer people who are visualizing and being affected. But also, the Germans were were always into efficiency, and these mm -hmm. large concentration camps just was more efficient. Right, right, Leslie. I'm reminded of Alice Kahana. She and uh, Harvey Rosenstock, Harvey was able to get a piece of her artwork donated to the Vatican. And they went to Rome and uh, met with the Pope outside in the piazza. And right. uh, Alice's family was with her, as were the Rosenstocks. And uh, a guardian comes out and brings out this huge uh, painting and uh, her daughter was with her um, a Down syndrome child who they raised like she was had no other problems and uh, when she introduced her daughter to the Pope she said and these are the first people they came for mm -hmm. with the trucks and putting them in and gassing them. Right. And it was just when I heard the story, it was very powerful. Very. And yeah. yet, the only nice thing that came out of it, the great thing that the Vatican has this artwork, is that uh, Judy Rosenstock said there was a little butterfly that was flying over this group in a small circle. And they deduced that that was Rabbi Kahana. There you go. Okay. So, just wanted to share. Uh, thank you. There's a good book called Ordinary Men by S. Ansky that that describes. He was a, he was a uh, reporter at the time that describes a lot of the shootings and things that. So from, that it's, it's a worthwhile read if you have the chance. Ordinary Men. Um, all right. Towards the end of the war. As the tide begins to turn, the last quarter of 1943, the Red Army wages a major campaign to liberate Ukraine from the Nazis. Number of cities. Kharkov had a Jewish population of 130,000 remaining. Kiev, uh, the capital, was retaken in November of the same year, 250,000 Jews remaining. Subsequent cities liberated Odessa, and others had pre-war populations of 300,000. There's a movement back. And with that, 
as the liberation of each city is happening, Jews begin to try to return, to go home. These are people who had escaped the Holocaust in one of three ways. Either they were hidden or helped by the surrounding Jewish populations. As much as we'd like to believe, well, that, because those stories are wonderful, it was small in number. A few survived the concentration camps. Again, very small in number. Some of them spent all or part of the war in the forests or with the partisan, partisan bands. And so there were survivors, but again, these are the infrequent occurrences. In addition to all of the hardships that these survivors had suffered, they also had witnessed the massacre of large number of Jews. So the survivors had seen the massacres and oftentimes of their, their closest relatives. They knew and sometimes were eyewitnesses to the cooperation of the local populations where they had lived, who had taken part in the looting of the property afterwards. An anonymous teacher writes about life under Nazi rule, reading number eight, and I, I think, Luke, can you, can you be heard yet or not? All right, so you've got reading number eight if you can. Yeah, I, I, I can do that. I just got to go back and forth, so okay. uh, hold on. All right. Number eight, of, um, from A Voice Called and I Went by M. Marshak. It's hard for me to talk about it. It's hard to talk about the atrocities I was an eyewitness to. It's shameful to say that in all the tracking down, torture, rape, and murder, local Ukrainians participated as well. I, too, am Ukrainian. The Germans took the best Jewish property for themselves, and the rest fell into the hands of local collaborators. When I consider that former students of mine were among them, I am seized with horror. All right, so imagine this mindset as you're going back to the community in which you were, you were, you were removed. The Jews who witnessed these atrocities with their own eyes or heard about them felt a, nat a sense for a, a requirement of a natural justice, all right? There had to be severe punishment of these people. The survivors justify justifiably viewed with hostility those who had looked on while their relatives were murdered. And these are people who lived alongside them for years. So it's like your next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. How do you go back to your community when you know your next door neighbor just kind of just watched as everything happened, did nothing, or afterwards went and took all the property from your home. Additionally, on a governmental level, the Ukrainian representatives tried to limit to some extent the number of return permits that would be granted to Jews to be able to go back. And so here you've got the anger of the Jews who see this as discrimination. All right, you've got this policy of discrimination is alluded to in a letter from the wife of a Jewish physician who's serving in the Red Army to the actor Shlomo Michaels, who we read about in Biro Bajan, head of the anti-Jewish fascist community, and reading number nine. All right, so I think we're, yeah, Joyce. I can do it, okay. Go ahead. It is impossible to get there an official, official permit. I have received no answer to my repeated requests. In Kalinia Dorf, I worked in the hospital. Now I would perform any kind of work. I am ready to work anywhere if only I can live at home. Okay. For many Jews, this policy aroused deep feelings of pain and humiliation. They believed that what they had gone through in the Holocaust and that they had stayed loyal to the Soviet Union through the war, not only should they not be discriminated, they should at this point be given preferential treatment. And that's not what they're experiencing. Among those who returned in early 1944 was the Yiddish poet David Hofstein, who wrote shortly before the, the, his return to Kiev, he wrote reading number 10, Eric. For months I made preparations, I prepared myself for the shock, for the anguish. For months I have been stifling the first scream that will erupt the moment I see their 
everything I already know, our disaster, our catastrophe in its full dimensions. So there's a denial. After going through this experience, there's a denial of what had occurred. When Hofstein returns to Kiev, he tries to organize a memorial meeting at Babi Yar. This had become the symbol of, of all these massacres. Not only did the authorities forbid such a public meeting, they considered the idea of holding it to be an expression of Jewish chauvinism, that which provokes anti-Semitism. It's your fault. Denying Jews the right to mourn publicly increases the tension that already exists between them and their former neighbors. A document drafted in 1944 by the People's Commissar addressed Jewish nationalism, which, according to the author, is fanning the fires of anti-Semitism. When you try to make yourself distinct, you fan the fires of anti-Semitism. Just, just to contextualize a bit, Soviet Union wanted no minorities. Everyone was to be a Soviet, a Soviet uh, citizen, and the Jews were not unique in this, but it had a major impact because of all the events of the Holocaust. What what is it? What are the areas that express Jewish chauvinism? Here are the, here's what they came up with: the attitude of their brothers, of the, excuse me, the attitude of the Jews who seek to defend their brothers from anti-Semitic attacks. How dare you associate with them just because you're a Jew? Okay, two, the transmission of false information that the Jews in the United States live a better life than those in the Soviet Union, because that leads to emigration and sympathy for Zionism. So don't be spreading rumors that life is better elsewhere. Three, the, circul the circulation of rumors that the Soviet authorities will give the Jews a territory where they can pursue their own national aspirations. Now, the Soviet Union had just done this. But now to talk about it or suggest it is an example of chauvinism. Four, if you make an appeal to the leaders of the Soviet Union to act against anti-Semitism. Well, anti-Semitism doesn't exist because you can't attack a group that doesn't exist. And five, the Jews' contention that the Central Committee of the Communist Party includes individuals with anti-Semitic attitudes, including Nikita Khrushchev. So if you identify yourself with a group that doesn't exist, who is being persecuted in any way, then you cause anti-Semitism. Uh, we'll stop there and take any thoughts or comments. From, from a historical, psychological, and any any response here. For me, the, the, the key fact here is, is the the universalizing of the entire experience and the denial of Jewish experience as a result. Mm -hmm. Lou, did you have your hand up? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Joyce. What, yeah. And what, what always surprises me, too, is that there is a deep nationalistic feeling within the Jewish population in the Soviet Union. And I I remember visiting refuseniks and, and the husband of one came out in his uniform from the from the Second World War and talked very vehemently about mother the motherland, Mother Russia. Mm -hmm. And you know, felt strong felt very strongly about it. You know, again, I think one of the things I said earlier is what's bad enough? At yeah. what point do you say, you know, most of us will say my country, I know there's flaws. I know it's it's not great. But, you know, it's it's my country. What is the line at which you stop and say time out? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true here in America, for sure. Mm hmm. You know, and and we do the same. We do the same thing. We identify with Jews for sure. You know, the Pittsburgh uh, Temple the Synagogue shooting. What did we all say? That's us. 
It's a natural tendency. That is the cause of anti-Semitism, if you look at what the Russian uh, commissars were saying. All right. The next two weeks, what we're going to look at is the same experience, but through the eyes of, of photo photojournalists. Mm. So um, there will be a, a number, of, a lot of pictures as well and that were taken. I want to talk about it through their particular eyes and 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 what they experienced, and because a lot of government policies were enacted because, because they were the distributors of information, and many of them were Jews. It was a field more prominently of, of Jews in general. So that's what we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. All right. Hope everybody is doing well. Stay warm. Start wrapping your pipes. <laughs> yes, it's about to become Alaska and Texas. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, everybody's well? Yeah. All right. Shabbat shalom. A good day. Shabbat shalom.